second here. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, first meeting in March. Hope everyone is doing well. We will uh, start with roll call, Georgia. Mayor Brooke. Here. Commissioner Sarah. Present. Commissioner Vignola. Here. Commissioner Simmons. Present. Vice Mayor Carter. Present. City Manager Babinick. Here. City Attorney Hearn. Here. All right, if everyone would please rise. And please join us uh, for a moment of silence with whatever is in your heart. Thank you. Mike Moser, will you come on up and uh, lead us in the pledge? Good morning, Mike. For which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I, I have a t-shirt for you, but it's not here right now. <laughs> all right, uh, we've got some recognitions coming up. Uh, Vice Mayor, will you join me for the first one? Good teamwork. Hey, Kim. Good morning, everyone. So we have a great recognition of our finance team here. Uh, we, I've requested that we recognize the Financial Service Department for receiving the Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting, not for the fourth year, not for the tenth year, not for the twentieth year, but for the fortieth year. Can you give them a round of applause? Uh, the award is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by our government and its management and this team before us. So I'm going to have Joy read this, present it to you, Kim, and if you can introduce your team. Okay? Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Rep Reporting presented to the City of Coral Springs, signed by the Executive Director and CEO. There isn't enough room on here for all those years. <laughs> thank you, I just wanna thank the Commission and all the City staff for helping us prepare this every year. We have Courtney, Melissa, Todd, Laura, and Tamir who work hard throughout the year to make sure everything's ready to go for our auditors, so thank you very much. All right, ready for a picture?
Our next recognition is the presentation of the 2019 Water Distribution System Award. And accepting from Public Works and Utilities Division are Alvin jo Jones, Water Plant Superintendent, come on up. Dwight Parrott, Utilities Superintendent. Michael Page, Utilities Maintenance Specialist. Bruno Zupp, Utilities Coordinator. Michael Medley, Utilities Coordinator. Cecilia Wells, Public Works Analyst. Linda Jiraki, Pro Project Support Specialist. Daniel Kenyon, Utilities Lead Worker. Jonathan Martinez, Senior Utilities Mechanic. And uh, presenting is Dr. Frederick Blotcher. Or did I blotch that? Blotcher? Close as Bletcher. Bletcher. Dr. Just Frederick forget. Bletcher. Uh, PhD PE Chair Elect of FSA WWA. So I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you. I'll be brief. Um, uh, as, as you know, I'm the Chair Elect for the Florida Section of American Waterworks Association. American Waterworks Association is the oldest professional organization uh, associated with water in the United States. In fact, in the world, we set the standards. Uh, Florida Section was created about 100 years ago, and every year we like to recognize uh, utilities who do outstanding things uh, for their customers. So it's my great pleasure. The fun part of getting to do this is I get to do these kind of things, right? So smile, come on, smile. Okay, we want to present, uh, so we have different, uh, different size utilities. So in Division Three, the Outstanding Water Distribution Service Award is for the City of Coral Springs. Congratulations from the section. Absolutely. All right, Chief McNally, if you'll uh, come on up and uh, help me hand out these certificates. And uh, Commissioner Simmons, would you like to join me, please? Chief Fry? Chief Martin? Well, we're going to, I'm going to I'm going to share a little bit first. But, but uh, Steve, you come on up. Um, and actually, Chris Bader, come on up. Come on up, Chris. Come on, Chris. So I, I'm going to share a little bit. I'm also going to bring down our city manager, who's the former fire chief, to share about this innovative, uh, innovative concept that started as a concept and now is making such a difference across the country. So um, when the effect of cancer was evident with our members of the fire department, it became former fire chief Babinex mission to find ways to improve health and safety. The apparatus team included two Coral Springs firefighters who had fought cancer, one of whom, Paul Pietrafeza, unfortunately lost his battle to cancer in November of 2016. If you've seen the video that was made, uh, it's an incredible moving video. Uh, and I so appreciate uh, Karen's uh, courage and you know, support of her husband and uh, being involved with our department um, and, and Paul helping us lead the way in this clean cap concept. 
A clean cab apparatus is an apparatus designed to facilitate a clean, healthy, and safe environment by reducing the exposure to contaminants that are associated with occupational exposures that are found in firefighting activities. It's now known that the routes of exposure are not only through inhalation, but through dermal exposure and through ingestion. The committee members, many of which you see here, designed an apparatus that removed equipment that routinely goes into a fire from the interior of the cab to the exterior body of the apparatus. The overall goal is to reduce the exposure of contaminants that are proven to cause cancer amongst our firefighters. This design has gained worldwide attention. Every fire truck manufacturer, I have chills as I'm sharing this, it's awesome. Every fire truck manufacturer now offers a clean cab design. Articles were printed in fire service industry, public, fire service industry publications and speaking engagement opportunities followed. I'm gonna let the uh, former fire chief and our city manager share some words and then pass it over to Chris. Okay, Chief? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this is something that started out as kind of a crazy idea. And I remember the conversation Chief Fry had with me uh, coming into the office and said, listen, I need you to hear me out on this one. And we sat there and talked. And after we heard what the committee uh, wanted to accomplish, I said, you know something, this makes sense, let's do it. And we started working on it. And as we started working on it, the science really started to catch up. Um, where the uh, UM got a grant to start doing some studies. And while this was going on, we started to form our safety and health committees within the fire department. Um, at the time, Captain Bader, now Chief Bader, uh, Chief Whalen were kind of spearheading that for us. So everything started kind of coming together. I don't think anybody standing here thought this was gonna turn into what it did. Um, you know, Debbie sitting in, in the audience here, she can tell you she probably sends out three or four 60-page packets a week to fire departments throughout the country, if not throughout the world, on what this concept means. More importantly, it, it leads to longevity and healthy firefighters. That's really what this is all about. And we now know through science that you can't just get back into that apparatus wearing what you are wearing and expect that environment to be clean. And we know that these extended duration exposures are leading to occupational cancer. So the best thing we can do is take away, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get rid of the cancer in the fire service, but we can reduce it. And this is one of those ways that we can really reduce the exposure to our first responders. And um, I can't uh, you know, tell you how, how uh, much it means to this group and, and to all of us that we continue to work towards that goal of, of making sure our firefighters are as healthy as possible. Uh, myself, Chris, Chief Fry, Chief Whalen, have had the opportunity to go around the country and speak on this, uh, on this initiative. And, and at first, people are a little skeptical, but when you sit down and really show them what it's all about, the buy-in tends to be incredible. So appreciate this recognition. These men and women deserve it. And um, Chris, you have a couple words you want to say? Well, a couple. You have a minute? I, honestly, I don't think I could follow up uh, pretty much everything you explained, but the bottom line is it's about the people, it's about this group here, it's about the individuals, it's about our employees, and I think this is just a, uh, a great way of showing innovation uh, within the industry of how we're able to take the science and actually apply it. Um, and actually, in a few minutes, I have to run to Station 43, where City of Miami is actually coming to see our clean cab okay. apparatus, so it uh, just shows that this is a continuous uh, process, so thank you guys for this. And, and uh, just real quick, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, our city garage and, and our, facility, or our, our apparatus team. Um, they do an incredible job, and when we started this initiative, we had older apparatus that needed to be retrofitted. These guys knocked them out of the park. They, they went back and, and changed the apparatus that were designed not as clean cab to clean cab. And the other thing we make sure we do is include them in on the training because they're exposed to the same thing. When they're working on, and people don't think about this, but when they're doing the maintenance on the equipment, they're exposed to the same thing. So we consider them part of this, a very, very important part of this team. And David, Steve and, 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 and his crew have just done an amazing job at, at keeping these apparatus, getting them up to speed and keeping them up to speed. That's awesome.
Um, so before we take a picture, I know Chief McNally uh, called all the names, but I want to make sure these names are repeated so that you see the men and women that are up here. Chief Steve Fry, right next to me. Steve Harbin, Zachary Roseboom, Karen Pietrafeza, Anthony Gonzalez, Michael Kent Caldaro, Thomas Palazzo, Vincent Beanie, David Eckwart, Michael Matz, Todd Malmsbury, and Jackie Watkins. If you can all give them another round of applause. Every quarter, we take a moment to recognize our great employees, and we have lots of them in the city. Uh, today, we're going, to not, we're going to recognize several employees who are our quarterly Bright Spot winners. These uh, employees were recognized by their peers for going above and beyond, and we're going to call them up. We have a few folks who are not able to attend today, but we're going to make announcement of them as well. Linda Fernandez, Development Services. This side, I'll this side. Uh, Samantha Fetner, Police Department, cannot attend today, but we want to make sure we recognize her. Seth Heitmeyer, Parks and Recreation, can't be here today, but we want to recognize him. Christine Parkinson, Communications and Marketing. Uh, Brittany Martinez, Police Department. Kevin Morgan, Police Department. Destiny Nichols, Police Department. She can't be here today. Billy Ray, Parks and Recreation. Justin Wall, Parks and Recreation. And Michael Zarillo, Police Department. Mayor, with your permission, I'd like to pass the mic and they can identify who they are, what department, and how long you've been with the city. I'm Kevin Morgan. Um, I'm on road patrol. I've been here for about a year and a half now. Um, it's the first time I've ever won anything, so I'm pretty <laughs> ecstatic. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Parkinson. I've been with communications and marketing for 19 years. Linda Fernandez, Code Compliance. It'll be 13 years in July. All right. Brittany Martinez, 911 telecommunicator. Been dispatching for five months. Awesome. Welcome. 
Bill Ray with Parks and Recreation, 39 years. Irrigation. <laughs> Cody Wall, a year and a half at the Tennis Center. Mike Zaria, I've uh, been a uh, rope patrol officer for six years with the uh, department and city. All right. All stars right here. Congratulations, everyone. All right, next up we have public comment. Are there any signed speakers? Yes, Mayor, we have two signed speakers. We have Shirley Richards and Nancy Matea. Great, so as they are coming up, uh, Shirley coming up first, I just wanna remind everybody in the public uh, that while it's your turn to share, many times we may not share back after we listen to you. Uh, we certainly don't wanna necessarily engage in a debate, uh, so, if we don't share at this point in time, please don't feel offended. And you can stick around for commissioner comments because if somebody wants to share at that time, we'll do so then. And it, Shirley, it's great to see you. I love the outfit. Thank you. Welcome. Shirley Richards, 5703 Northwest, 109 Lane, Coral Springs. Dr. Deborah Weiss, Deborah Weiss Dance Company, 980 North Federal Highway, Suite 110, Boca Raton, Florida. Welcome. Men their rights and nothing more. Women their rights and nothing less. Susan B. Anthony. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Women of South Florida, come and celebrate your 100th anniversary. If you vote, own property, are employed, or manage your own finances, you stand on the shoulders of many brave women who fought for 79 years to give you their, their future the right to vote. On Sunday, March 22nd at 2 p.m., the Coral Springs Festival of the Arts will journey back in time with a living history reenactment of the suffragette fight for the vote. Voting rights for women celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage by the Deborah Wise Dance Company with guests Palm Beach State College Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society. Bring your daughters and your granddaughters, your friends and sisters to say thank you to Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and thousands more. I wanted to thank the mayor and the city of Coral Springs for hosting the festival and for having us there. And as we come down the road toward the 2020 elections, I think we should remember the women's struggle because it came down to one vote in the state of Tennessee. Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify the amendment, which made it law. And it came down to Harry Byrne, the youngest legislator. He knows the story. He was 24, and his mother wrote him a note. And she said, Dear Harry, if it comes down to your one vote, be a good boy and do the right thing. Help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. And he changed his vote at the last hour and it became law. So I hope that our piece inspires young people and people of all ages to exercise their right to vote. It is the foundation of our democracy. And I think in the last election it was sad 46% of the general population and 50% of millennials stayed home. So we're hoping to galvanize people. And based on the primary so far, it looks like more people are turning out. So that's good news, right? We want everybody to vote and to take part in their community. Thank you. I hope to see you all there March 22nd. We sure do. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it.
Nancy, if you'll come on up, let us know your name and address. Good morning, Nancy Mateo, 9833 Northwest 54th Place, Coral Springs, Florida. Please excuse me, I have a little cold. Um, happy Women's History Month and good morning, Coral Springs Commission. I am a proud member of the Broward County Commission on the Status of Women Advisory Board, which is a nonpartisan body with a focus on raising awareness and celebrating the contributions and successes of all residents in Broward County. It provides a collaborative platform for those seeking information on issues that affect women, girls, and their families in our county. This year, we are celebrating the women's suffrage centennial, as was just presented. Across the US, governors, state, and legislators, and local governments are drafting executive orders and joint resolutions to recognize, commemorate, and honor their state's role in the passage of the 19th Amendment by lifting up a community's local history in the fight for women's right to vote. Executive orders and joint resolutions are an opportunity for our local government to celebrate the historic milestone in the suffrage story. The Broward County Commission on the Status of Women wants to encourage passing and joint resolution to honor the milestone in Amer American democracy. I am asking if our city would sponsor an official proclamation to recognize women's suffrage centennial in the month of March or uh, in June for the ratification of the amendment of Amendment 19. This proclamation would lead would lend official recognition to the important work of educating the public on women's contribution to our history. The board and I would be more than happy to work alongside the commission and the city staff to assist in any way. As a member of the board, we appreciate your support of the Coral Springs Commission and city staff. Thank you for considering this special request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, no other signed speakers. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to be heard? Okay, seeing none, public comment is closed. We're on to public hearings, special meeting announcements. Item number five, resolution 2020-004, Cornerstone, Cornerstone, downtown Coral Springs Platte. Julie Krolak. Julie's gonna handle this item. Great. Uh, Good morning, Good morning Julie. everyone. Request to uh, hold a public hearing after Richard Gorman. You got it. So we're here for one more item for Cornerstone. I'm sure you all remember la at last month's, or last week's meeting, um, you approved the special exceptions for the overall project. So here before you today is the plat approval. Um, for those who may not remember, the, the project's going to happen at the existing financial plaza building, which is just east of us here, um, at the southwest corner of U University and Sample. The property right now is a little over seven acres in size. I guess my time is up, so thank you. Time is up, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> and really the plat just lays out the parcels for development as well as things such as easements or non-vehicular lines and driveways so that you get the basis um, and as well as looking at the parcel itself for concurrency at the county level. So um, you can see here um, the parcels are very similar to the north and south buildings you saw as well as um, carving out a smaller piece, parcel C, for the hotel. The green that's surrounding the property are actually right-of-way dedications that they have. So um, as I mentioned, it's a little over seven acres right now, and with the dedications, it'll be a little over, it'll be about 6.3 acres in size. So we are recommending approval. We do have a couple just cleanup conditions, such as vacating a couple easements that are there right now, as well as uh, um, recording a master plan agreement for the, the cross access and cross parking for the development itself. With that, we're here for any questions. The applicant is here as well in case you have any questions of them. Okay, this is a public hearing. Would anybody from the public wish to be heard? Robert, you putting your hand up? You want to be heard? Mayor White, Robert's coming up. I'll just note that Rob the quasi-judicial portion of this hearing has been waived. Right. Robert Fogel, 10991 Northwest 12th Drive, Coral Springs. Good morning, previously, Robert. Good morning, good morning. I had previously mentioned uh, to a few staff members and to a few commissioners about my feelings about this project. Uh, number one is the tenant's garage. I honestly believe that it should be totally by itself, 
not in addition to the hotel. Number two is, uh, and the reason being, if you live in a building, you don't want to be involved with, you want to be able to go up to your own place and, and not have to be involved in strangers or anybody else going in and out of your parking uh, facility. The other thing is, I don't know if we ever talked about the security. You do have a high school across the street. We all know that the city uh, uh, high schools in this community has some problems. They are going to walk across the street and they are going to infiltrate that whole shopping area. And I think security was not mentioned at all. The third thing which I'm really disappointed in, is the rental versus ownership. I've spoken to almost everybody on this board about how to reduce the amount of rental properties and increase the amount of ownership, because ownership is very important to the city of Coral Springs and all cities, to, to be honest with you. People take ownership in, in the cities and also in the educational system because ownership means that they're bought in. They own the property and they want their children and the schools to improve. Those are very, very important issues. And the last thing is the kind of businesses that's going to be entertained in that shopping experience. That's very, very important. Uh, and that's really one of the reasons why I'm, I'm uh, getting more and more involved in the city of Coral Springs because I know that our businesses must make a profit to, in order to want to remain here and live here. And I think that's extremely important for the success of the city is that we really get involved. And let's not forget about the deciduous trees putting up royal palms around this complex so that we can see who's in that shopping center. All right, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. It's nice to see you here on a regular basis. I really do appreciate it. Awesome. Would anybody else from the public wish to be heard? All right, seeing none, the public hearing is closed. And Mayor, the petitioner's here as well. Okay. Any questions for the petitioner? Okay, any questions of staff? May I hear a motion? Okay. Moved by Commissioner Vignola and seconded by Vice Mayor Carter. Any discussion? Yes. Uh, so um, I, I want to say thank you to Robert for um, giving us, you know, his suggestions and the things he's been thinking about. Uh, as you all know, we all uh, want and respect um, public comment and input on these important matters. Um, I will say personally for me, um, my mom did not have her first home until I was nine years old, nine, ten years old. Uh, and so I lived in rental apartments for much of my life. Um, and I attended public schools uh, in the area. And I made honor roll and all kinds of things uh, while I was there. Um, and so also I want to let you all know that until the state allows us to um, uh, work on inclusion, inclusionary zoning and, and being able to do something with the prices of affordable housing and things like that, um, most people in South Florida can only afford possibly rental. People uh, can't really afford homes that much anymore. Not to mention uh, the millennial generation, um, home ownership within that generation is the lowest out of any other generation in this country's history. Uh, and so it's just not practical uh, for, um, you know, if we're gonna do new developments and things like that, to have home, uh, you know, to have that home ownership there. I mean, yes, I am very fortunate and blessed uh, to be able to afford being in a home right now, but that's also because I have a very amazing fiance who makes sure that we, we have a good life. But uh, for a lot of people, uh, it's very challenging to even um, think about uh, home ownership. And, and um, I do understand what you're saying as far as, you know, when you do have a home, you're invested more and things like that. Um, but I know for a majority of people, they just need a place to live. And they need a place to raise their family. They need some stability. Uh, you know, and um, so I appreciate you, you saying that, but until we can get more control um, here at the state, I mean, at the local level from the state, um, my hands are kind of tied as far as developments. Any uh, further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? All right, it carries unanimously. We're on to the consent agenda. I am pulling 10, 11, and 12. Are there any other pulls? All right, seeing none, Vice Mayor, you want to make a motion? Move to approve. Moved by Vice Mayor Carter, seconded by Commissioner Vignola. Any discussion on the other items? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, it carries unanimously. I have uh, pulled uh, item number 10, uh, primarily just to share openly and for uh, John Hearn to share with the public and with our dais about, um, you know, when we have bids, is there a conflict when we know one of the owners? Uh, so I happen to know one of the owners of Big Dog Construction, uh, David Rosenoff, a former Parkland elected official, and I had asked John, is there a conflict for me to vote? And John, will you share with us what you shared with me? Sure, and, and Mayor, thank you for bringing it up. Anytime anyone has any question on that, it's always great to get that question before the meeting. So under 287 of the Florida statutes, everyone up here has a duty to vote, and unless you have a pecuniary interest of some sort, um, you or, or, or your family member, uh, there is no conflict and you have a duty to vote. Um, you and I spoke a little bit about uh, how that might work. So if you had a, a son or daughter that was uh, at a small business and we were voting on, on giving them business, more than likely you're going to have a conflict, you're going to have to uh, um, abstain from voting. But if you had a son or daughter that just had an entry level job, let's say at a General Electric or something, that would not be deemed a conflict because of the size of the business. So, so there is an analysis that goes through that. Um, having um, friends in the business does not uh, qualify as, as a conflict unless you have some sort of business deal with them outside of that. You, you, you and I spoke about it, you do not, so your duty to vote remains. Okay. Thank you. May I entertain a motion on this item? Move to approve. Moved by Commissioner Vignola. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Simmons. Any discussion on item number 10? <clears throat> I just want to commend staff on making sure that, um, you know, and looking and getting very local and very close, um, you know, businesses to uh, award this con these contracts to. So just thank you to staff for that. Okay, any further discussion, item number 10? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, carries unanimously. Uh, next, I've pulled <laughs> item number 11 to just highlight uh, the sculpture, the, the sculpture, the sculpture on sample and art walk. Uh, Julie, if you'll uh, share with us a little bit. If we could bring the PowerPoint back up, that'd be great. Um, so this year's sculpture and sample program, we have five sculptures that the committee um, chose. They're all included in your backup, but just to give everybody an idea, of, it's definitely an eclectic uh, group here. We have a little bit of everything included. Um, so these sculptures will be on temporary loan to the city through about June of this year. We like to get them you know, taken back before hurricane season starts. So they'll be on loan for a couple months. They'll be installed along Sample Road on the pads that we have, as well as a couple on the Art Walk as well. Um, and um, the public will have the opportunity again to vote on which one they like at the, at the uh, Festival of the Arts again. Um, and then from there, the committee will decide whether or not to purchase any of the pieces. Um, and anything that would be over $20,000 would come to you all for approval as well. So that's pretty much it. Great. And do we have dates of the installations yet? Um, probably within the next, I would say, two weeks. Um, we were hoping before the end of March for sure. And are, are there ever, like, an opportunity for others to come and celebrate the installation of any of these public pieces? We haven't done it for Sculpture and Sample, but when, usually when we choose one to purchase and we install it, we have some type of event okay. to unveil it. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. Yes, Commissioner Simmons. We don't. We don't, okay. <laughs> we just invite anyone from the public, because even just people along sample okay. that aren't residents would be seeing them as well. Understood. And then the second question, how many, uh, I guess, are, are we only looking for one piece or uh, multiple? Like how, I mean, I guess, how do we, how are we figuring out which ones are going to be selected? Um, well? After the program, the committee decides. Sometimes they like more than one, and they choose more than one to purchase. Okay. Um, sometimes they choose one. In the past, they've also decided, once the program is over, not to choose any of them. Okay. So it's really what they have in their budget and what the Public Art Committee wants to recommend. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, sure. and thanks to the Public Art Committee for their great work. They do a great job. I move to approve. Moved by Commissioner Second. Simmons, second by Commissioner Vignola. Discussion, Commissioner Vignola. Yeah, so um, my time here on the commission, I've gotten comments good and bad on a lot of items, but one of the most common complaints I've gotten is a certain sculpture that the city purchased on University <laughs> Drive on the south end of town. I like it. Um, I'm not saying I do or I don't. I think a lampshade would be a great addition to it. But, um, <laughs> and uh, so one, one of my concerns with this, and that, that's not my comment, I've heard that from you. Oh, that's um, funny, Larry. That is funny. I love it. So, so uh, one, of the, one of the, you know, with that being said, and with the uh, opinions and things that I've gotten complaints on, I'm sure you guys have gotten complaints on over the years, I would like to go ahead and say that, um, and, and like to ask for an amendment to the motion that um, all these would come back um, to the commission regardless and, and whatever the recommendation is for us to approve it. So I think this is something that is going to be in the community for a long time and the fact that multiple people from anywhere can go ahead and vote on it, I think ultimate say really should um, come down to this commission for approval. Um, I think any, personally I think anything over $5,000 that we spend on the artwork that's going to be out there publicly we should approve it. So I'd ask for friendly amendment to that to have that brought back to us. You have to move it? You yeah, yeah. I, well, I have a question of staff. Sure, okay. sure. Um, would that be burdensome or anything or, you know? And, I, and I'd like to hear a little bit about the history. Well, uh, most of the pieces we purchase, you know, like the, the rats and things like that are under the 20,000. Of course, the larger pieces come to you anyway, if it's over that 20,000. You know, any of the pieces along the art walk came to you. Um, so out of these five that we have, I think we had four of the five, three of the five would come to you, would come back to you anyway. Because of the dollar amount. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I will say that, um, Commissioner Vignola, I, um, and to the rest of the commission, you know, I feel like it, it's the, the city, um, you know, not the city staff, but just the city outwardly or public, public space functions better when we do kind of know what's going on. And so I don't, I don't see any harm in us just seeing what's coming, but I don't know, you know, if you're saying we need to vote on every single piece. I would say on the sculptures on sample. Though the, whatever those purchases are, we do it every other year. Um, I think there's one purchase every other year. So not the rest of the city, just saying. Not all the different things, but, but the things like this that will be here for a long time that are significant pieces that will be seen throughout the community. And, and over the years, we've taken some of the pieces that the city's purchased and moved them around the city sure. and things. And these are really permanent things. And you know, the wraps, they're gonna get changed over time and whatever, but this is something that, that's gonna be permanent and we'll hear about them through the, um, through the other stuff. So over, what I don't wanna get into is um, overriding, overruling the public art committee, right? If their job is to make those selections and those are the people that we appoint to that committee to do that job, um, I don't. I don't want to want to get into the point where we're stepping over on what their mandate is. For the so, so I, I feel the same way uh, as you do, um, Commissioner Simmons. Uh, that has never been what I wanted in the past when I served, and certainly not what I want now. Uh, I do appreciate uh, Commissioner Vignola. You having gotten so many comments. You know, we are the leaders of the city, so. You know, could we potentially do something different even about that piece of art however many years later? So I would, I would suggest we kind of workshop that discussion, uh, but it's still up to you whether you accept what Commissioner Vignola has said about these pieces of art coming back to us to amend your motion. I would, and, not, and, accept and the, I would not accept the friendly amendment, okay. um, but I hope that we, do, we can workshop and talk about this. Well, so, yeah, we'll definitely add it to uh, to the workshop calendar to talk about. And I do believe there's either a policy or ordinance that was approved by the commission that governs the expenditures. I recall that too. Yeah, so we would have to look at that as well. Okay. And right. I really do appreciate where you're coming from, Larry. Truly. Good discussion. So it's not accepted. The motion still stands. Any further discussion on the motion? How soon do you want to see that come back to you? Um, since these pieces are going to be, Julie, these are going to be up until about June. So as long as it's before that, we should be good. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Before then, good. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Carries unanimously. 
Uh, next is item number 12. We have President Connie Shives here from uh, Coral Gardens 2. This is the 131st Neighborhood Partnership Program Grant on a total of $1,706. And uh, Connie, if you'd like to share a few words with us, we'd love to ha hear from you. Yes, I, I first would like to thank you guys for making this grants available to, to um, homeowners or, or um, condos. Uh, it's very helpful because, you know, every dollar counts to all of us. Um, I especially like to thank Jackie Foster for making me aware of this grant policy and Alex here for helping um, get all the paperwork done properly and, and put through in the way that it needs to be and doing some background work that, he, that needed to be done that I wasn't able to do. So he was very helpful through this whole thing, so I really appreciate it very much. All of our homeowners and our condo association appreciate it. Whether they're aware of it or not, <laughs> it's saving them money. So I want to thank you all for, for um, the opportunity to have this grant. It's our pleasure, and thank you for your partnership with us. We love that. Alex, did you want to say a few words? Not too much other than uh, thank you to Connie. Um, when I first came on, this application had been received, so it did take us you know, close to the process of 10 months, which was fairly long to get it done. It usually doesn't take us that time, kind of time frame, but uh, the community and Connie were both great, very patient, and we're happy to help. Also, just a quick note, as I was coming in here, totaling up the amount that the city and neighborhoods have contributed to the NPP program, we're closing in on a million dollars. So somewhere wow. we're at $985,000 total. So I think uh, a couple of months from now, maybe a couple of years from now, we'll have a pretty good celebration for once we cross that million dollar mark. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jackie. All right, may I entertain a motion to approve item number 12? So move to approve. Second. By Commissioner Vignola, seconded by Vice Mayor Carter. <coughs> Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. <coughs> All right, carries unanimously. Congratulations. We are now on to uh, policy formation and direction. Oh. Item go. number 16, <coughs> Ordinance 2020-016. Oh, one, uh, dash 105, sorry. Uh, this is an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs, Florida, amending Section 11-11 .11 of the Code of Ordinances, entitled Noise Disturbances, in order to delete a conflicting application fee, providing for conflict, providing for severability, providing for codification, providing for an effective date. Um, we had first reading on this in public hearing. This is second reading, and this is just aligning the fees so they're not inconsistent. Morning, Chief. Morning. I'm just here if you have any questions. I sure. This is the second reading, and uh, but if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Okay. Any questions for the, our chief? Seeing none, may I hear a motion? Move Moved by Commissioner Second. Vignola. Seconded by Commissioner Sarah. He finally <laughs> got in there. <laughs> uh, discussion, Commissioner Simmons? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Next is our CAFRA and item number 17. As Kim comes up, um, Mayor, I just want to uh, really acknowledge Kim and her staff for the great work um, that they do and, and, and was done on this on this uh, report. I had a chance to meet with our auditors and they could not say enough about staff's um, just response to questions and information and how organized everything was. So gentlemen, I appreciate the work that you do in working with our staff. Kim, great job. Thank you, I just wanna thank you again for recognizing our award for the 2018 CAFR today. We are presenting for you to accept our 2019 CAFR, and we have Brett Friedman and Anil Harris from RSM to do a presentation and answer any of your questions. Thank Welcome. you, Kim. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's our pleasure to be here. Uh, my name, again, is Brett Friedman. I'm a partner with RSM, and with me is Anil Harris, the senior manager on the job. You should have received two documents, the small one, which is the report to the Honorable Mayor and members of the City Commission, walks us through certain required communications. The much larger one is prepared by your staff, who as I said, they do an outstanding job. Just for perspective, you know, we work with a lot of governments all throughout the state of Florida, and this city is always one of the first ones to complete their audit, and that's because of how efficient they are in providing the information and getting this document done. So just to start first on the required communication, I'm gonna turn your attention to page one. I'm just gonna walk through some required items. The first one is that we did the audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. 
government auditing standards and our arrangement letter with the city, which was dated July 18, 2019. At the beginning of the audit, we provided this commission with a letter just kind of outlining the scope and timing of the audit. Uh, most important there is, again, due to the support from the team, we are here at the meeting that we had intended to be at, so clearly everything got completed timely. As far as accounting policies, we normally like to bring your attention to that because that's the area where there's a lot of cash in, cash out into the city, but it's in your policies and more specifically in the estimates where there can be potential manipulation by management, so it's a key focus for us. Uh, the first one is in the current year, there were no new accounting policies that were put in place, none that lacked proper authoritative guidance, no, no new uh, GASB policies. There will be some coming in the future, but current year, nothing significant to affect the city. Also importantly, we did not identify any significant or unusual transactions, things that lack proper authoritative guidance in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. There were no audit adjustments to the original trial balance. That should give you comfort throughout the year that the information you're getting from finance is complete and accurate, because we do do a thorough job really trying to attack and look for everything as, as is our job, and we had no adjustments. Also, no uncorrected misstatements. On the next page, we had no disagreements with management. We were also not aware of any consultations that they may have held with other accountants. No significant issues during the audit. There's a, uh, a letter communicating significant deficiencies and material weaknesses. In your case, there are none to report. And then at the end, there's a couple other required reports that are provided. The management letter in accordance with the rules of the Audit General for the state of Florida. And also, there is an attestation report required regarding the investment of public funds. Both those reports, again, no issue. On the next page, page three, just want to quickly point out a couple of the, the significant accounting estimates. This is where it has management's judgment and can potentially impact the items. The two key items to highlight are the actuarial assumptions that are used for your self-insurance program. You know, the city uses a third-party actuary to help calculate that. We have our own specialists look at the calculations. I have no concerns with the approach or the assumptions taken. They are consistent for a city this size in accordance with you know, basically uh, professional practice. Same with regard to the accounting for the pension plans for the city's net pension liability. Same thing for each of the plans. We have our own actuary look at the actual report done by your specialist, look at the assumptions and methodologies, no concerns or issues with that. There are a couple others on the next page. I'll just highlight one more, which is significant, which is the accounting for other post-employment benefits. This also, the city uses an actuary to provide assistance. We again have our own actuary review it, look at the assumptions and the methodology, make sure it's consistent in accordance with standards, no issues or concerns. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Anil to uh, just give you a couple of key highlights on the report itself. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're gonna go over the actual financial statements. The first item, or first page I wanted to bring to your attention is page one, and that's our audit opinion. opinion and as Brett mentioned, the actual booklet and all the information is prepared by management. <clears throat> the only thing we own in the document, <clears throat> in the document is the audit opinion. <clears throat> And it's an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion, as we would say. So the highest level of assurance any auditor can provide to a client. Had there been items of significance, we would have modified the opinion and brought it to your attention. But for your cases, there is no matter to bring to your attention. The next section is pages 4 through 19. Um, that's the MDNA, and basically it's management's summary of the operations of the city year over year. And if you read anything in the document, I'd advise you to read the MDNA because it kind of gives you a summary of how the balances change from one year to the next, you know, how the revenues perform, how water expenditures was like, how your budget to actual looked. Um, the next item, I, the next page I wanna bring your attention to is page 26, and that's the general fund um, statements. And the reason we focus on the general fund because it's the main operating fund of the city. So the first column on page 26 gives you the results of operations. So as you can see, um, the the general fund had $134 million of revenues. The city expended $118 million. Um, then there were $14.6 million of transfers out. That money went to other funds, um, predominantly the debt service fund to service the debt. So if you look at the third line from the bottom, the general fund re ended the year with $1.5 million positive um, net income or change in that position. And basically what that means is that your revenues and all your expenses and transfers out, um, the revenues are more than those amounts. So 
you had a positive results. And it, you ended, the city ended the year with a $29 million fund balance. Um, also wanna take you back to page 24, which gives you the balance sheet for the general fund. And what most we focus on is the fund balance or the end of the bottom part of the statement. So at the end of the year, the city ended with a $29 million fund balance. And that's about 25% of general fund expenditures, which is um, very healthy. But one thing to bring to your attention and keep in mind going forward is the unassigned, which you look at the bottom part of the statement, all the fund balances have been assigned for, you know, whether it's stabilization or future projects. So going forward, you wanna keep your, pay attention to that and make sure you kind of build that unassigned area as a reserve, basically. The <clears throat> second section I wanna bring your attention to is the tab that says single audit. And pages 164 to 172 is basically our reports on compliance, one being re, um, internal controls over financial reporting and the city's um, compliance with its grant programs. All, all of these reports, again, are unmodified opinions. There are no findings or no items to bring to your attention. Um, looking at page 168, the city expended $4 million of federal dollars of federal grant monies. And on page 169, $862,000 of state grants. Um, we tested those um, programs or major programs and noted no findings or recommendations and basically that means that the city complied with the requirements of those programs. And with that, we'll take any questions you have. Okay, any questions? Yes. Could you go back and talk a, a little bit more about the, um, the you said you wanted uh, us to keep our eye on the uh, uh, unassigned special uh, reserves? Yeah, that's on page 24. So currently, you if you look at your committed balances and assigned, it's about, if you sum it up, it's about 25% of your general fund expenditures, which is healthy. Uh, most entities want to be in the that area of 20 to 25% reserves. The unassigned just means that even though you can tap into the committed balances and the assigned, it just means that you've basically assigned all the fund balance for future projects or other purposes. Um, you know, as part of just normal governments and budgeting, going forward you would want to and any entity would want to build that unassigned, meaning that's just excess reserves in addition to the normal reserves that you would have. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, um, you classified on page four um, 982,000 as non-spendable. Uh, what does that mean and where does that money go? Non-spendable means that it's either you've prepaid for an expenditure or you have inventories. So basically, even though it's an asset, it cannot be converted to cash for use. So the accounting requirements requires that, basically for that purpose, to let you know that it's not available for spending. Gotcha. Yep. Thank you. Any further questions? Motion to approve the report. Moved and seconded. Any, did you get, catch that? Seconded by Commissioner Sarah and moved by Commissioner, oh, by yep. Commissioner Bignola. I got that wrong. And uh, moved by Commissioner Simmons. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, be, thank you, Kim. Because Commissioner Sarah has to leave a little bit early, we're gonna pull up his portion of commissioner comments. Yeah, I, I apologize, but I have a, a very important meeting at 1045, and uh, this is the first time, unfortunately, as a commissioner I've had to do this, so I appreciate um, the indulgence. Um, I just want to congratulate and thank staff that participated and organized uh, Unplug on February 22nd. It was a very successful event. Once again, residents coming together, showing community, which is awesome. Uh, we want to continue that uh, and look forward to future events. As far as uh, the, the conversation around uh, the workshop uh, and parks master plan, I'm excited about our future. I'm looking forward to working with the commission and moving that work. I uh, want to congratulate the J.P. Terravella drama um, team and also uh, Miss Sessions on an outstanding performance of Susical on Thursday. I appreciate the invite and really enjoyed the evening. Uh, I want to thank staff for putting together, uh, and residents may not know this, but staff constantly is going through training here internally. And just most recently we had a, a social media training and uh, the, the team did a phenomenal job, and I learned actually quite a bit, and I'm gonna be looking forward to bringing some uh, 
some ideas to a future uh, conversation. Uh, also, World Fest, for those of you that participated and organized, thanks for the invite, and I enjoyed the uh, Sunday afternoon festivities. And if you ever need to get a hold of me, I can always be reached on my cell phone at 954-612-7114. Uh, if you would like to meet, uh, we can coordinate something uh, in the morning or in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we're going back to the agenda. Next is item number 18, Parks Naming Committee, Rob Hunter. Good morning, Rob. Lori Sessions does a great job over she there. She does. Amazing. We're just here to answer any questions that you have. I brought Lewis with me. He was actually a part of the process, so if you have any questions, he'd be able to answer them more in depth than I would. So, Mayor, on, on the uh, parks naming, you see there were four items that were, um, that were considered. Three were recommended, and one was not recommended. So if you'd like to go into anything further, please let us know. Okay, any uh, questions? All right, moved by Commissioner Vignola. Second. Second by Vice Mayor Carter. Any discussion? Yes. I just want to point out, as we go over this, um, this item is approved a community garden pathway to be named the Helena Ramsey Memorial Garden. Um, we approve the police gun range to be named the Robert Behan Firearm uh, Training Facility and approve a lane at Mullins Park Pool to be named the Negro Charette Memorial Lane. These are all awesome and I appreciate the hard work that you guys have done here. Thank you. Ditto. Any further discussion? Yeah, thank you for your efforts, Lou and Rob. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next is an appointment to the Multicultural Advisory Committee of Rena Kapoor. Uh, apparently, she was the only applicant to the Multicultural Committee. It's a request to appoint. I'd like to move it. Moved and seconded. Yes. I just wanted to move it. I know it normally when it's not your committee, but I've known Reno a long time, and uh, I think she'll be a good addition. So. All Sounds in. Good. Did you catch that, Georgia? That seconded, yeah. Uh -huh. All right, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, carries unanimously. We're moving on. We're on. On to commission communications, and uh, we'll start from my right, Commissioner Vignola. Um, have a great day, Commissioner Sarah. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Saturday, I had the uh, honor and privilege to throw out the opening day pitch for Coulson's American Little League for the tenth year. It's one of the favorite, my favorite things I get to do because um, I spent most of my childhood growing up there, as Deputy Chief McKeon would attest to, as uh, both. <laughs> His parents and my parents served on the board there for many years and spent almost every night there for majority of the year. Um, so that was that was a nice event and the uh, um, lighting and everything. I had a lot of comments about how much better the park is with the lighting improvements and things. Um, we had the fire awards earlier this week. Um, former chief, current chief, great job. The, uh, it's always wonderful to be reminded of all the amazing stories that come out that as residents, sometimes you do take for granted. Um, you know, the fact that our public safety officials on both sides do such an amazing job. We're very fortunate here in this, in this community. Um, on, uh, well, I guess in, in, on March uh, 17th, we're gonna be dedicating the Walter Skip Campbell <coughs> Avenue right out here on 94th Ave between Sample and 31st Court. Um, that's 10 a.m. St. Patrick's Day um, because of how proud Skip was of his Irish heritage. Um, I'd like to ask the commission to make St. Patrick's Day this year um, Walter Skip Campbell Day here in the city of Coral Springs. I'll take that as a motion. I'm going to second the motion. Any discussion on the motion? It's a wonderful idea. Great awesome. idea. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, carries unanimously. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. And, um, Ms. Skip, um, my office hours this month will be moved um, to March 24th uh, at noon at Pasquale's on Royal Palm. Uh, if anyone would like to meet with me or discuss any item, you can always call me on my cell phone at 954-632-7544. Thank you, Mayor. Great. Thank you very much. Commissioner Simmons. Uh, yeah, I want to um, first echo um, Commissioner Sarah's comments about the staff putting together Unplugged and uh, Downtown, uh, not Downtown, but uh, Innovate, Innovate Downtown, I think that's the name. Um, you know, I, I was not able to attend, but... Um, from the pictures and talking to the people and listening to their feedback. Um, it you know, just seems like you guys keep knocking it out the park. So uh, at some point, you're going to get tired of hearing us say thank you and <laughs> for all the work that you all are doing. Um, 
the second thing, and I'll keep my comments short, I got to, you know, get comfortable soapbox time. Um, courage versus cowards. Uh, we live in a social media time where it's easier to be mean, disrespectful, rude, um, because you have a computer screen or a phone screen in front of you and you're not actually seeing the person who you are saying these things to uh, in front of your face. Um, I firmly believe, and maybe it's because I, um, I don't mind shying away from conf confrontation, uh, that if these people were face to face with each other, they wouldn't say 75% of the things that they say. Uh, those people that are going out of their way to um, disrespect folks, make people feel bad for how they look or what they say or how they think are the worst kinds of human beings. Uh, it is courageous to publicly state how you feel about something. It is courageous to take a picture of yourself and put it out there for your friends and family to see or maybe because it makes you feel good. It is courageous to uh, time and time again take a stance against something that you know is not necessarily popular. It is courageous anytime you let your thoughts about who you are, how you think, how your lived experiences shaped you, uh, it is courageous to do that. And it is only cowards that will spend their time and energy to break those people down. And we live in a world where it's fun to get likes for making fun of folks. But these are real human beings on the other side of those screens. And so um, we live in the age where social media is affecting people's uh, mental health. And we just need people to be a little more kind. Love people for who they are. We are all uniquely us. All of us are individuals. And anytime someone goes out of their way to break those people down, you all, all of us, including myself, have a duty to try to shut that down. That's all I want to say. Thank you. And if anyone um, wants to reach out to me, my cell phone number is 954-871-1314. Um, I'm not sure where my office hours are. I try my best to work on them with Luam, but, you know, uh, once they get scheduled, you'll know and I'll know and we'll meet. So thank you. All right. Vice Mayor Carter. Thank you, Mr. Ray. I also want to thank um, all, congratulate and thank all of the city employees, near per perfect financial reports, clean cab initiatives. It's just so much heart and soul goes into making our workplace so much better. Thank you. You do a great Sweet. job. I um, want to invite everyone to join me Friday, uh, Saturday morning at 7 a.m. at the center for our peace walk, where we will walk in peace at 7 a.m. that's this Saturday. And then my favorite event, what is it? The third weekend in March, the Coral Springs Festival of the Arts at the Walk. So that will be on Saturday. And come out on Sunday, just like Shirley said, there'll be a great performance uh, honoring the Women's 19th Amendment. And uh, wear white. Even though we don't look good in white, wear white. If you need to reach me, I'm at 954-998-4186 or joycarter at coralsprings.org. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So um, in today's moment of silence, I thought primarily of two people. Um, I had a moment of silence in honor of Mayor Campbell, uh, whose term I am concluding, um, and just very grateful for his leadership, his mentorship, his wisdom, his contributions to our community, and my heart continues to go out to his family. Um, I have a picture of him every day when I'm at uh, the mayor's office upstairs. I pay tribute to my predecessor and my friend, and I look forward to the dedication. Second person that I thought of uh, in my heart is my mom. So many of you have heard that I lost my mom to suicide when I was 23 years old. Um, this is my soapbox. I'm committed to eliminate the stigma associated with mental illness and associated with the need for mental help. I have been working with about 200 individuals in the community, many from Coral Springs, many from outside of Coral Springs. We have formed a not-for-profit. It's called the Mental Wellness Networking Alliance. The acronym is MWNA. We meet the first Wednesday of every month. We meet at 6 p.m. at Keller Williams at 3301 North University Drive. What's the suite? 120. Suite 120. Uh, our vice mayor knows that because that's her real estate office. 
And uh, that office has been made available for our community on a regular basis in an outstanding fashion. I can't tell Keller Williams and their leaders there and Scott Bagoon who helped arrange it enough thanks and appreciation. Because I want to share with you all a little bit of magic that is occurring in our community as our community comes together, again, not just in Coral Springs and Parkland, but surrounding areas here to combat mental illness and change the dialogue. Because when you think about it, right, we all want wellness, right? And we've, many of us may have associated mental illness, oh, that sounds bad, that sounds horrible, taboo. I know it because I lived it. I know it because that's how I lost my mom. Um, I didn't know my mom was ill. She seemed a little bit down. I was at Tulane University in New Orleans. I grew up in New York City. Graduated in May with my MBA. I'm the first person in my, in my family to graduate from college, let alone from graduate school. My mom couldn't have been prouder. She seemed a little bit off, but I didn't have a clue. And about six weeks, seven weeks after my graduation, happened to be the day after my first daughter was born, although I hadn't met my first daughter yet, that I lost my mom. And so the silence that so many people suffer in, the silence is a killer. So I am committed as Marsha's son, not in my official capacity as mayor, I'm committed as AJ's dad, as Aiden's poppy, as a friend in the community, I'm committed to eliminate the stigma. Uh, we have a website from MWNA. The website is eliminatethestigma.net. We regularly have anywhere from 50 to 75 people come and attend the meetings. Uh, Randall Cutter is uh, typically there at our meetings. And the meetings are powerful. We have two primary goals. One is for suicide awareness and prevention. The other is to eliminate the stigma. The third goal, which wasn't an original goal, which is something that we are accomplishing in a, in a manner, shape, form, that winds up being a support group. It's a support group of people that have lost people to suicide. It's a support group, sor support group of uh, people that have struggled themselves or struggled in their family or in their close environments with mental illness. As I shared before, we're helping to reframe the dialogue. So we don't say that somebody committed suicide. We say that they died by suicide. Uh, it's our belief that suicide is not the choice of a mentally well person. We believe that depression is not a choice of somebody to have or experience. Anxiety is not a choice. Being bipolar is not something to be embarrassed about or have it in your family to be embarrassed about. I've shared this portion of my story before and I appreciate the indulgence from everybody and the participation that I feel from your eyes and your hearts that are in the room, including my colleagues on the dais. Uh, years ago, I had started something called the Innovation Table in our community, again, as a community member, not as mayor. And at the Innovation Table, we speak a little bit about problems and mostly about solutions. And the other requirement is that you have to have civil, respectful dialogue, regardless of how much you disagree. And at one of the innovation tables, uh, our chair of the CIGC, Lorraine Campbell, this is back in maybe 2007, she shared, what if we eliminated the word embarrassment? And I was like, wow, hit me like a ton of bricks. Because I had been embarrassed that my son was an addict. I'd been embarrassed that my son was an alcoholic. I'd been embarrassed that I was the father of my child who struggled through this. Within a minute, I was no longer embarrassed. Within two minutes, I began seeking solutions publicly. So I don't say this to make people feel bad if they prefer the privacy of whatever they or their family is struggling through. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to impose my will or my wishes on them. But I am here as a leader in the community, as a father, as a son, as a friend, uh, to urge anybody that if they have something like this in their family or themselves, share. Because by sharing, you can seek solutions that you may not have sought before. 
you know, just recently we lost yet another community member to suicide. And that, again, I share with you the silence kills and the openness and the receipt, the receipt that we can give to others of having them land with us and having them tell us that they're not okay. And for us to be able to be responsive and tell them it's okay not to be okay. It's okay, it's good to seek help. I think this kind of dialogue can help not just our community, but can help our nation. And so where does it start? Well, for me, it starts in my home. And then it spreads from my home. So I'm inviting anybody and everyone to come tonight to Keller Williams and, uh, and come see and be part of something special because the conversation that we have, and we have therapists there, usually 10 to 15 therapists. We have adults, we have students, we have clergy. Uh, pretty much every stakeholder is there. Uh, you'll come and you'll be a part of something very unique. And no matter what you may be going through, you will not feel judged. You will feel supported. And you're going to make at least a few new friends. And for sure, for sure, you're going to know that you're not alone. Um, for me, it is such a pleasure um, to be, you know, part of this dais and, uh, you know, have this soapbox about something that's personally so important to me. And I know that with enough people and enough movement, we can reach the tipping point. We may not eliminate the <coughs> stigma, so I'm shooting high when I say eliminate, but we can certainly reduce the stigma, and I think we can save some lives. <coughs> so that was what I was thinking about in my moment of silence. I thought about my mom and how she can help me potentially help others. Um, so thankfully, uh, with God, help, therapy, friends, love, my wife, I've been able really, really, really to focus so much on my mom's life and not her passing. And for me, she's left 100% impact, although I haven't you know, seen her physically for 32 years. Uh, so even if you've suffered a tragedy like that, you can still have you know, some, some joy in your life and, and be able to be a part of something very special. So I really appreciate everybody listening and, and letting me share openly. Uh, and, and, and feel my heart, so I appreciate that, thank you. So I have a couple of other things. Uh, I would really love to recognize the Coral Springs Youth Soccer Directors. I thought I had asked for that before, in case I didn't, I'm reiterating it. I mean, I'm saying it for the first time. Uh, Coral Springs Youth Soccer is something that has been an integral part of our community for so many years. At one point, we were the second largest youth soccer program in the country. And the directors there just do such a good job. One of our uh, firefighters that was here, Mike Caldero, he's a director. And I'd just like to bring up the directors, and may maybe they're 30, 35, and, and tell them individually, thank you for what you do for our youth. They have patience. They have vision. They've been doing it for many, many years. I'd really like to recognize them. This Saturday, uh, I coach my grandson's team. We're going for gold. We, won, we uh, won the last several games that we played, and we shoot for the championship game. And I can't tell you the joy I had years ago helping to raise my, my son through the program and being able now to do it with my 11-year-old grandson. It's out of this world. So may I have your support to recognize CSUS directors? I didn't have it before. So we have a, we're going to be bringing recognitions to you in a, in a uh, uh, workshop soon of exactly what the process will be, and we're going to put more of a formalized process in place. Um, but that won't be until I think we have it for May. So I would rather not wait until the end of that if I can have your support. Great. I've got it. Thank you, guys. Uh, a couple more things. World Fest was great. That committee, they've been around for a long time, large committee, and I appreciate all of their work. Uh, I had talked briefly about a peace and love event, you know, some vision. Somebody had mentioned what if we did yoga in front of the, uh, the sign, if the ground could be just so. So I don't know if we're going to talk about that at a workshop or you have something in mind already. For we, we have uh, actually um, Susie and, and Lynn are working to come up with a program for some of the stuff that could happen out there. Oh, wonderful. Great. Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, my office hours haven't memorized them, but they are on the website, coralsprings.org. 
and anybody can reach me on my cell phone, 954-696-7599. And if by some chance you send me an email a while ago and I haven't gotten to it, uh, go ahead and text me. It's fine. Let me know who you are, what your challenge is or question, and I'll do my best to answer it. And uh, my support, uh, our support here from the day is Luam. Luam, you're doing an excellent job, great communication. You have a sense of urgency, so pleasant. Uh, and always solution oriented and you're making my job easy. So thank you. So that's all I have. Uh, on to uh, Frank. Just a couple yeah. things. Um, it was mentioned before. Um, there was a couple events that I want to just reiterate. The fire department's award ceremony, uh, you know, was was incredible again this year. It does highlight a lot of, uh, of the work that's done by the men and women of the Coral Springs Parkland Fire Department. But when it really hits home is when you see a seven year old walk up to the stage that was lifeless when you got there. And several months later, she's you know back to uh, living a normal, normal childhood and, and, and that's what we strive for. So there's a ton of those stories out there, but I wanna congratulate all the men and women of the fire department that were recognized. Finance department, Kim, great job. Uh, we said it before, but just wanna reiterate uh, <coughs> the great work that you guys do. Um, to our bright spot winners, you know, the city is blessed to have um, just so many uh, talented and uh, caring employees. And, and that's just a sampling of, of, of what we have in, in totality for our employees. So congratulations to our Bright Spot winners. I wanna ask Alex Falcone just to come up uh, and give us a brief update. Um, there's a lot of concern um, and worry right now uh, with what's going on with the coronavirus. Um, we sent messaging out uh, to our employees uh, yesterday and we'll continue to do so. Um, but uh, Alex, is, as you know, is our emergency management director and I uh, just want him to give us a quick update of what he knows and, and kind of some recommendations for the community to follow. Okay, welcome, Alex. Good morning. Um, so as we mentioned <clears throat> during your workshop uh, last week, we are being proactive in responding to this and we are closely monitoring what the World Health Organization and the CDC says. Um, later today, we're gonna put information out on our website for our uh, residents to publicly view that vetted information. Um, what we do know is that this virus uh, is spread less easily than the flu. Um, a lot of the same steps that you take to prevent catching the flu, you can take to prevent catching the coronavirus. That's washing your hands regularly with soap and water. That's making sure that you have your, your flu shot already from the, from, that's what the CDC recommends, and making sure that you're staying away from folks that do have that virus. Um, we've taken steps to make sure that we procured PPE for our first responders. One of our main goals is to make sure that we're continuing to provide quality services to all of our residents. Um, and what we're urging residents to do is go on our website later today, view all of our comprehensive tips of how you can prevent this, and make sure that you're taking those. Um, I do want to address in the media, we've heard that the mortality of this virus is, is higher than the common flu. That is true. Um, those who are most susceptible to this are people that are elderly or already have immunocompromised. Uh, they're already immunocompromised. So a couple of ways that you can prevent that, make sure that you have a healthy routine, you're eating a balanced diet, you're reducing stress, you're exercising regularly. Um, if you are an immunocompromised individual, we, we stress that you follow your healthcare provider's recommendations and that you make sure you take the steps necessary to prevent uh, that transmission. One of the biggest things you can do is just personal hygiene. That's, that's the biggest uh, defense you have. Any questions for Alex or? No, I'm really appreciative that you brought Alex up. That's Thank you. Great, great information. And then the last thing I have is this Saturday, Relay for Life out at Sportsplex. Um, so if you can get out there and support um, that, uh, that event, it's, it's very important. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Frank. <coughs> John? Thank you, Mayor. Two items. One is the settlement agreement that you as the board of the museum passed. Um, that was our first meeting as the museum board. So as the museum board, um, it's a separate 501c3. However, we've taken over the obligations of that board. One of the obligations of that board, um, as we discussed earlier, was the payment of uh, an electrical bill. Um, the settlement simply provides that we pay what is due and owing and to do it in a uh, without interest and in a several year uh, pattern so we don't have to have any additions to our budget. So uh, it's a simply request now because that those funds are coming from the city uh, to authorize that settlement and the payment of the bill. And to be clear, so is that requesting a budget amendment at this point? No. No. We, that, it, 
the, the money's coming from, uh, I'm not exactly sure where it's coming, but to the extent that needs an amendment, we'll move forward with that later. Yeah, we, we have reserves that will cover the okay. cost. Great. All right, may I entertain a motion? <coughs> Moved by Commissioner Vignola, seconded by Commissioner Simmons. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Carries unanimously. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the second one is what I brought up at the workshop, which is, is a resolution for the mayor to sign, which is simply opposing Senate Bill 1174, which reduces the local communication sales tax to the city, uh, and obviously resulting in an uh, unplanned loss of funding very significant to the city. So it's just a resolution opposing that, that bill that we discussed at the workshop. So I get a motion to approve, draft, and adopt that. Mayor, it's about a $1.3 million loss to, of revenue to the city. That's significant. Uh, Commissioner Vignola has moved it. Second by Commissioner Simmons. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All right, carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you, Mayor. That's all I have. All right. Yes, something else? Larry? Um, yeah, one more thing. The um, For those that didn't see, Waste Management has now changed their mind on mixed paper, mm -hmm. and they are not planning to cancel the recycling uh, They're not. mixed paper. They are not going to cancel Okay. Good to know. Um, so that's really, really great news for the city. Thank you for the update. And we'll be bringing you um, um, to a workshop what we want to do with our recycling plan. We want to change things a little bit because um, we do have an opportunity to uh, possibly be a little more diligent in the way we do recycling and making sure the proper things get in the proper can. So you'll hear from our public works director, Rich Mashad, shortly in a workshop on that. Is there a, a city in the country that's like known for their amazing recycling program and maybe it's a, a municipality we can model? I'm just throwing it out there. Even if it might take time, because I, I believe our board is very, very environmental friendly and if there's some vision that's out there that's already working, you know, maybe we can emulate. Right, so I would say the, the gold standard in Florida is really the Pine Beach County Solid Waste Authority. Um, they have their own facility. Uh, they have their own um, recycling processing. Things are done in-house. Um, but they have a two-sort system in Pine Beach County. So I live in Pine Beach County. I have a yellow and a blue bin. There are still, uh, the guy still gets out of the truck, comes and empties the uh, bin in, in, the, in his vehicle, and he gets to see what's in there before he empties it. When we went to single stream about 10 years ago, we, we moved to a cart system. Um, generally, we went to the cart system in 2014, but 10 years ago is when it started. And uh, because you can't see what's in the cart and it's automated, you really have to, you get what you get. And, and that has resulted in some- and You don't get upset. I'm well, upset. you know, um, it, it does bother me that people aren't recycling right. And that's what our goal through this, this modified program is to get people to recycle right. Marketing through Lynn and Paul have done a great job trying to have that soft approach to education. Contamination rate still goes up. We are about 36% countywide, about what we are in this city as well. So we've got to find a way to, to reduce that. And we've got a few ideas to share with you at the okay. March workshop. I have a comment. Yes. Um, I was on 441 yesterday and just stood out loud and clear bus, bus benches and it said, no plastic bags or no something about plastic bags not in your recycle bin. Exactly. That's the that biggest picture. contaminant we have mm -hmm. right yeah. now. And that does not go well through the sorting machines at the uh, waste management facilities. Going so, up and down 441. so that makes me think, Frank, when one of us is doing the commission message, you know, every month, if we can have it in our mind and Lynn can put something in as a reminder what else our citizens can do to eliminate contamination or reduce it. Yeah, and, and we'll, every time. we'll look at that after the workshop because you're going to we're, we're we're actually going to what we're proposing is is a big change in the okay. way we do it today, okay. and and we kind of have to because Rich is right the the contamination rate is just ridiculous, and we're, mm -hmm. we're we're recycling for a reason, but we're not achieving that reason because of the contamination rates. Gotcha. Great, thank you, Rich. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yes. Um, I, uh, sorry, last thing, um, you know, I was sitting here thinking about it. It's a shame that uh, Commissioner Sarah had to leave early uh, for his meeting and not a shame because he's taking care of his business, what he needs to do to take care of his family, uh, but just a shame that uh, we still live in a, a society where uh, you have to be torn uh, between being a public servant and doing what you need to do, you know, for your family 
Uh, and so, um, you know, since I got here, I've been um, asking, you know, staff about, you know, changing in commission times and, and meeting times. Uh, and, um, you know, as a body, we did work to get to, um, you know, moving to the 6.30 time slot uh, for all of our business meetings um, in January, starting in January, um, hopefully, <laughs> starting in January, um, uh, because it's just, it's just a shame um, that he's not able to be here uh, and listen to all of us and kind of be in this with us. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we'll continue to move forward uh, and really rethinking about the people that we want to serve this community and how we're making room for all minds and thought processes to be able to serve the, this beautiful and wonderful city. So, And, and that is, uh, we have that slated for January 21, and we have it slated to come to the commission over the summer to discuss and, and vote on uh, to change the, uh, the meeting time. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. We are adjourned.